Hi team, welcome to another day of just having a great conversation with John. And John, we're so grateful for you, for your time, for your talents, and most importantly, for you giving all of our listeners hope and really just joining our team in a way to be for each other, for well-being, helping us win well-being. And so thank you for joining us. And Today's desired outcome is all about giving hope, and we want to give hope not only to ourselves and really talk about our minds, our bodies, our hearts, our immune system, everything that really goes with everything about who we are, as well as giving hope to our world, our community, and the people that we are given the opportunity to be engaged with. So John, thank you for joining us again for a great conversation. Thanks, Carla. It's always good to be here. Well, you are such a gift and definitely a great example of winning well-being. So let's start with giving hope from an immune perspective, because we know that we are really in the battle of taking care of ourselves right now, whether we've got vaccinated or not vaccinated, kind of re-entry or not re-entry. We have a global brand. So you're in Australia, we're in the US, we've got a great team in New Zealand. We're all at different stages as to where we are kind of from a re-entry perspective. So where are you right now and what have you learned from an immune system perspective? Oh, look, it's such a great question. And, and I think that, um, you know, we're really in an interesting place right now where human health and environmental health have collided head on, like they really have. Yeah, you know, we can listen to theories about viruses coming out of Chinese labs. And, you know, the lab that everyone's talking about is apparently a French lab anyway, just happens to be in China. Or we can listen to the more, I think, the more valid and more rational argument that these viruses have come from totally fatigued, mm. um, broken soil. Mm. And we don't really get enough learning about our, 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 the human body and human health. But to, to break it down pretty quickly, there's somewhere between 10 and 15 quadrillion cells in a human body, right? So that's 10 to 15,000 trillion cells. Maybe 2% of those cells are human. So about 2% of those cells are all the genetic material that makes up our bodies and all our systems and our bodies and our blood and all that sort of stuff. The other 98% is bacteria and fungi. So the first layer, all that human genetic cells, we call the human genome. The other is the microbiome. And some people will be listening to this thinking, how's that possible? Well, they're much, much smaller. But your whole body, all of the external surface of your body is covered in this amazing microbiome. Mm. And the external surfaces of your body include your lung cavity and also your gastrointestinal tract. And so the small and large intestine are teeming with trillions of these amazing aerobic bacteria and fungi. Now, when the microbiome is thriving and fully optimized to its greatest potential, the genome basically can't get sick. The microbiome creates this wonderful cocoon around the genome, you know, but we didn't really understand the microbiome until the last couple of decades. Mm. So we've been spending a lot of time trying as hard as we can to destroy it. <laughs> So first of all, before we you know, go further than that, how have we destroyed it? Well, antibiotics is the number one, you know, and really in our societies, antibiotics should be left for emergency hospital use only. Never, ever, ever take antibiotics. <laughs> it wipes out your microbiome. Um, too much sugar, preservatives in food, and in the last 25 years, perhaps the most devastating is glyphosate, which is an agricultural chemical used in genetically modified organisms. And, and, the, and it's basically they're designed to protect the crops from other plants and, and pests and that sort of thing. And it's commercially known as Roundup. 
and the destruction of glyphosate on the human gut and the blood brain barrier is shocking. It, it is so shocking. It, it is, it's almost unfathomable, mm. you know. And so on the, on the day that we're born, as we pass down through the birth canal, the final gift that our mother gives us is she basically implants the, um, the, the whole of the, the earth's basically uh, content. What's the, what's the word I'm thinking of? I've lost the word for a moment, but it basically gives all of the bacteria and, and fungus and everything that exists on the planet in the soils your mother implants that on your skin. And that's the start of your microbiome, okay? Then when she breastfeeds you for the first few days, that's when you populate your, your gut. Now we went through a period there where a lot of kids were born by cesarean and they didn't get the, the vernix coating their body. And a lot of kids weren't breastfed. So we then bred generations of kids who've got allergies and they're really sensitive and their bodies are a little bit fragile and that sort of thing. And we learned some lessons about that. But the thing is that we can always be doing things to keep uh, strengthening our microbiome and restoring it and building it by eating fermented foods and spending a lot of time in nature. Just when you're out amongst the trees and you're breathing in, you're breathing in this amazing bacteria, you know? And, um, and by not consuming things that destroy it, <laughs> which means no more soda, right? Um, and, and too much alcohol and, you know, and, and foods that are loaded up with uh, pesticide residues and that sort of thing, which is factory farmed animal flesh and those sorts of things. So John, so, can you give us some examples? I mean, great words of wisdom. Give us some very specific, you said soda, you said alcohol. I just want our listeners to be able to take everything we're talking about today and be able to have hope, number one, and number two, change exactly what they're doing from this conversation to really set them up for success. Yeah. So I, I, it's almost like Imagine you're living in a time and all of the uh, logistics chains in the world, all the supply chains collapsed and your supermarket could no longer get supply. So all the things you buy in the supermarket, you just can't get anymore. So you have to turn to the local farmers to find out what they've got so that you can eat. Mm -hmm. So basically eating anything that, uh, that arrives naturally. So, uh, you know, I do most of my shopping at farmer's markets. Right. And you get clean food at farmers markets. And I'm sorry to the supermarket chains, but if they want my business, they're gonna to have to change what they do, yeah? And also when you go into supermarkets, you're constantly fed temptations to buy things that you don't need. You might want them really badly, but you don't need them, you know? So um, giving your body a, a break. And, and I would say, if you could make a decision to give your body a break, two months break, of no soda, no sugar, no um, cheap oils, like mm. all those oils, those highly processed oils, soybean oil, canola oil, all those, get rid of those, mm. go back to coconut oil predominantly. And, um, and lots of fruits and vegetables. And if you're gonna eat animal products, grass fed, mm -hmm. stuff that's lived a natural life, you know? And, and you're going to go through some pain and suffering because you're going to be craving chocolate and you're going to be craving your McDonald's and that sort of thing. But, but you can do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you really can do it. You have it within you to do it. And if you just give yourself that, your body will start to clean itself and your microbiome will start to reclaim its territory. And all the while, eating fermented vegetables, uh, drinking kombucha, drinking kefir, those sorts of things are really, really help to populate your gut. Then if you add to that, supplementing vitamin C, vitamin D, you guys probably don't need vitamin D in Arizona because you've got plenty of sunlight. It's like us down here. And zinc, zinc's the forgotten one, 50 milligrams of zinc per day, you know. And uh, vitamin C, you can take lots and lots of it, you know. And um you know, when you do those things and start to lay yourself to get more sleep, mm -hmm. you will start to rebuild your immune system and you'll get to the point where, okay, you can't stop viruses entering your body. 
but your immune system will deal with it. Because I want to tell you how clever your immune system is. The, um, the microbiome that's sitting on your face, for example, because it's covering all of your skin, if a coronavirus hits that, the signaling system starts. Mm. Your body knows. Mm -hmm. And everything starts moving into place. The communication network mm -hmm. in your microbiome is profound. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's going to be ready. And, and if that virus enters your body, number one, if you're really healthy, it can't get into cells. And if it does get into cells, your immune system will marshal really quickly. So it's living a natural life, living like your supermarkets run out of supply and you can't get that stuff that you normally get. And do it for two months, just two months, you know? Well, and John, that's what I wanted to set our team up for is that you're talking about a season for two months. I know we've got some challenges, 30 day challenges going within our team. And so team, let's just add this to a two month challenge. It's all about really being healthy, being for you. And so tell us the desired outcome of the two month season, John, what does that do for us? Well, number one, you're probably going to lose some excess weight that you don't need. Number two, your liver is probably going to regenerate unbelievably. And, you know, a lot of disease starts with a sick liver, you know, so really your liver is going to improve your, uh, lots of your faculties will improve, your eyesight might improve, uh, your, your sleep will definitely improve and your cravings will go away. You'll no longer have cravings. That's a big one. And, you know, it's often cravings that then drive reactive behavior in us. Mm -hmm. So you're most likely going to become a more relaxed and much nicer person too. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about the cravings because we all, you know, this sounds really good in terms of, yes, we want a great healthy body, mind, heart, you know, everything about it. Two months is a season. We can all do two months. We've got this team. We can do anything for two months. And so what performance barriers are going to show up? And a performance barrier is any barrier that gets in the way of us being able to accomplish whatever it is we're going for. So a performance barrier can be anything from I'm hungry to, you know, I don't trust you. It can be gigantic. So we really yeah. neutralize it by having anything that gets in the way of you being able to do and be and everything that you want just be a performance barrier. So I hear cravings. I think of performance barrier. Walk us through what's happening when we experience a craving. Well, yeah. I mean, cravings can be physical mm -hmm. and they can also be something that exists in our consciousness. You know, um, we all have feelings. And, you know, one of the things that I, I'm often sharing with people is a feeling and an emotion are a different thing. Mm -hmm. A feeling is just a feeling. An emotion is a response to a feeling. So you can feel sad, for example, then you might have all these emotions of crying and sobbing and all that sort of thing that are associated with the feeling of being sad. But the sadness is just a feeling. And what I've learned is that if we resist a feeling, it stays there mm -hmm. and it just, and it won't go away. And we constantly keep having the emotional responses to that feeling mm -hmm. until we allow ourselves, for example, with sadness to curl up in a ball mm -hmm. under a blanket for as long as we need to and fully feel that sucker mm -hmm. until we've fully felt it and it starts to diminish and it goes away. But I reckon the same thing with a hunger craving. You know, if you start to feel hungry, what you automatically tend to do is get up and just go and get something to eat. And you go on this automatic pilot and you find something that you really love and it's really yummy and it's probably disgracefully bad for you. <laughs> I hope not. I'd love for us to love something that we're eating. <laughs> but what you can also do is just notice it and go, wow, I feel really hungry. Mm -hmm. And allow yourself to just sit there and feel hungry mm. and dramatize it if you like. Um, stand up and play out the act of somebody who's <laughs> dying of starvation. <laughs> and, and it'll go. Yeah. And it won't be there. Because your body actually doesn't need anything. I mean, all of us who live in the Western world, 
we could get dumped out there in the Arizona desert for 20 days. And we, as long as we have water, we wouldn't die because we've got plenty to feed off, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, just allowing yourself to feel the craving, recognize what it is, enjoy it, mm. actually enjoy it, you know, and have fun with it and let it go past. Mm. And it can be a little bit like craving for attention from your boss, you know, <laughs> same thing. Emotions, uh, emotions, emotions, right? I mean, they're a great part of life and they're also can be a performance barrier. So the beautiful part about that is just honoring it. We call that truth, just recognizing I'm hungry, I'm craving, I need some attention, I want some chocolate, I take this, you know. I love the component of really just connecting to who we are and mm. connecting to what we're feeling and connecting to what we're experiencing versus trying to suppress it or disconnect or just power through it. I mean, what a gift to give ourselves to just honor whatever it is we're experiencing. Well, yeah. I mean, the reality is if you take on what I've said about 60 days, you're going to have a period, especially in the first week, where you're going to be starving you're, you're, and you're going to think maybe that you're failing in some way. No, you're not. That's just, that's what comes with it. It's a bit like, um, you know, if uh, if you walked up to me and said, do you mind if I bash you over the head? And I would probably say, I do mind. But then I might go and decide to go and play a game of football and I fully expect to be bashed over the head and I'll enjoy every minute of it. <laughs> yeah. you know I mean? it's, like, it's all about the way we think about things. <laughs> Absolutely. It's like you you go out and you do stuff that you enjoy and you, and, and you endure all this physical pain because you're enjoying what you do. So, you know, why not enjoy it when you're not? You know? Well, it's worth it. It has purpose. So let's talk about purpose because as soon as I know why I'm doing what I'm doing, there's no stopping me, right? I mean, in terms of our competitive spirit that we have, we're talking to high achievers, all of our clientele is, you know, executives, athletes, we, we're used to setting goals and going for them and knowing certainly we're going to have distractions, we're going to have to anchor in discipline. I mean, but the better word for that is purpose, just the power of purpose and really knowing why we're doing what we're doing so that when we're feeling that desire to give up or to quit, we can take us to really what is our purpose and why are we doing this? Well, I, I agree. It's like, how can we give our best to the world if we're not at our best? Mm -hmm. And I don't want that to sound like a cliche, but I'm going to share something personal with you, okay? So I'm 61. I'm a big guy, I'm six foot four, and um, I have eight siblings, and we grew up in pubs, and we drank a lot of soft drink, and food was laid on. So weight gain is something that comes really easy to all of us. I'm probably the only one that hasn't succumbed to it. Now, I look at all that, I look at my life, and then I look at my son and my stepdaughters, and they've got young kids. And I think to myself, I cannot allow myself to become a burden to them because they've got families to raise. Mm -hmm. They've got careers to run. And the last thing I want is for them to be running around after me because I'm too sick to take care of myself. Mm -hmm. so that is then my reason for eating well for exercising making sure i get enough sleep and for also handling my cognitive abilities mm -hmm. keeping my mind clear mm -hmm. you know um, that's my responsibility to them and hopefully when i'm 98 i'll just curl up peacefully one night and go to sleep and not wake up and everybody will celebrate the fact that i had a good life you know but but that's that's a big part of my purpose. But also in doing that, I can inspire other people around me to take the same path, right. you know, and um, you don't have to follow this natural thing of going into retirement places and ending up in care and that's scary. <laughs> well, and, and John, I just want to speak into the heart and the love of, you know, I don't think anyone intends to end up in that particular situation. And there's just so many things that we can control, which we're talking very much about what we can control in terms of what we eat, what we think, what we do. 
And then there's going to be these moments in time that change our lives that we don't have a lot of control over. And that's really our mental or our, our just our mental well-being from that perspective of what are we doing with whatever's happening to us and how are we managing it and how are mm -hmm. we finding a way to really make the most of whatever is showing up in our lives. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, and, and it's a cool thing. It's like even you know, any sort of limitation that we have on ourselves, you know, um, you know, and again, I take my life, for example, I can't run as quickly as I used to run and I can lament that, or I can enjoy being the best I can be right now and make the most of it, you know, and, and, and it's true that, you know, people do get struck down by things. You know, I've got good friends who are, uh, who have been struck down by things like motor neuron disease and that sort of thing. So misunderstood and, and so much to learn. But like one of them was an ex-champion footballer here and a champion coach. And he's, he's just so inspiring. The guy, you know, he was being interviewed once and, um, and the interviewer said to him, when did you first get an inkling that you had this terrible disease? And he said, oh, I remember the day. I was playing tennis with my brother and he started to beat me. And I thought, damn, I must have that disease. Because <laughs> I'm not going to lose my brother. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, um, but then there's, we've also, I think, got a, you, you know, sometimes, and I'm going to be brutal here, but sometimes we play the genetic card mm -hmm. way too wrongly. And the reality is, that most cancers, heart disease, diabetes are lifestyle diseases. They're not genetic disorders. And, you know, for me to say that um, I have a genetic history of cancer because my dad and his brothers had cancer, that's crazy because I haven't got long-term checking from their fathers and their grandfathers and those sorts of things my dad and his brothers were all big drinkers, you know, and they smoked cigarettes and that sort of thing. But if we look at, if you just Google and ask what was the primary cause of death in the latter years of the Egyptian empire, heart disease and cancer, mm. wealthy societies overconsume, get lazy and get sick. That's our challenge. So it's a different form of survival you know, back in, there was a period where people's fight for survival was finding enough to eat. Right. Our new fight for survival is not eating too much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, John, I just want to talk about that starting point because every bit about what we're talking about is, I don't know anyone listening that wouldn't want exactly what we're referencing and what we're talking about, but you know, if, if I'm overweight or if I don't know how to exercise or, you know, I'm choosing not to, and I've got myself in some rituals and routines that aren't so fabulous for me, what is that starting point? I know in our coaching work, it's all about the power of team. I mean, find a teammate, find somebody who can walk with you, find somebody who you can talk about recipes with, find somebody who can be for you. And then also just, you know, start to celebrate your short-term wins. Do, you know, win the day, make it one day, and then we'll have another day. And, you know, so just kind of take us through the power of making these small choices and setting ourselves up for success. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Uh, and, you know, and the thing is, don't set yourself up for failure. You mm -hmm. know, that's, that's craziness. Um, and, and everybody's going to do it in a different way, but it's so crucial to have a bit of a community around you and maybe find four or five people who want to achieve the same thing that you do and get together and, and have your honesty sessions. And there's a couple of things. One is to have a clear goal. What is it you want to achieve? Number two, have a plan. How are you going to get to that goal? Don't just start with no plan because that ain't going to work. <laughs> Number three, when you have a bad day, mm. label it a bad day. It's not the end of the world. Mm. It's not like um, your house just crashed and fell over. You just had a bad day mm. and put it down to that and get back on the bike the next day. Mm. 
Or even John lets out a bad choice, right? I mean, if you have a meal and you end up drinking too much or eating too much, okay, so you lost that meal. We can still win the next meal. We can still win throughout the day if we're really thinking about it in sports. I mean, if every day's game day and the whole day is a game, you know what, you win breakfast, you have halftime at lunch, and then, you know, just kind of keep really encouraging yourself to pay mm -hmm. such attention to those short-term wins. Absolutely. And, um, <clears throat> and it's really crucial also to have not, not to have stuff lying around the house that uh -huh. you don't want to, be, you know, get rid of that. <laughs> Big Set yourself out. up for success team winning strategy. Absolutely. And, you know, and here's a really important thing. Okay. No putting yourself down. Thank you. Yeah. No self degradation. Do not degrade yourself. Your parents did not bring you into this world for you to degrade yourself. You know, you're a human being. Keep going. Mm. Keep going. You know, it's it's all okay. Yeah. You can get there, you know. <laughs> so, John, let's talk about that gift of being for ourselves. Really, you know, our best friend, our best supporter, our, you know, so intentional about being for us. We're so good at being for other people. We can be their cheerleader. We can say, whatever it takes, let me know and I'll help you. And we just, we have this spirit of connecting and giving to other people. And when it's time for us to give to us, it's almost as if we get the worst of it or we get the least of it. And we can only give what we have. We cannot give away love if we don't feel love. We can't give away joy and hope if we don't feel joy and hope. So let's talk about the power of love and how to really start to anchor in that self-love so that we can take this, take on this two month challenge and win it. Yeah, it's so cool. There's a, there's a, an exercise in the resurfacing workshop in the avatar course called caring for the animal. And, you know, because the physical body is like, you know, it's your animal, right? Mm -hmm. And it's such a beautiful exercise because it talks about taking time to just stroke your body and acknowledge it and thank it. Mm -hmm. no criticism mm -hmm. it's like it's your body mm -hmm. you know and just really love it and and enjoy it and 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 then from that place we can support it more you know and i think there's a there's a real key in one of the things you said there too Colleen, because um it's uh we have this thing where we're doing things for other people. Now, intention is really crucial here. If I'm going to do something for somebody, am I doing it because I want to help somebody and I want to see somebody do well and thrive or I want to relieve some suffering? Or have I got a bit of a contract there where when I do that thing for that person, I'm hoping to get something back? And a very simple example is if you're in the traffic and there's coming up someone coming up on a side street, do you back off and give them room to come into the traffic? You know, and I ask people that question when I'm talking in the corporates, and a lot of people say yes. Yeah. So I, I put I always back off and let people in, and I said, and how do you feel if that person doesn't acknowledge you for letting them in? And they say I get really angry. <laughs> And so then I say to them, so your intention was to set somebody up to tell you what a good person you are, mm. not to let another person in, you yeah. know? And it's like, and they really feel it and they go, that's exactly what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Whereas if your intention is just to keep the traffic moving forward, well, then you don't care whether the person acknowledges you or not. And so I think sometimes when we get that exhaustion from helping others, it's because we've got a little bit of an agenda running that we want something back, you know? Whereas if it's just pure, we're never exhausted by it because we get joy out of seeing them receive. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't serve ourselves too. Mm -hmm. And every time we give ourselves good food, we're mm -hmm. serving ourselves. Every time we take time to just have quiet time and relax, we're serving ourselves. Mm -hmm. Whenever we have an early night to get a good sleep, we're serving ourselves, you know. Going for that walk through our favourite trail in the forest, that's serving ourselves. And that part is so self-nurturing and it is so crucial to keep restoring our energy because, 
And here's the catcher. When we serve ourselves to restore ourselves, that is profound service to others. Mm, it's beautiful. Yeah. John, I want to explore restoration because so many times we hear the word rest or restore. And I just feel like the we're in a season of restoration. Every part of us has been going through grief and going through uncertainty and going through change and trying to be positive. You know, I mean, there's just been a lot of emotion and activities that have been happening in, in this machine of ours, in our hearts, in our heads, with our friends, with our family, with our community. And when I think about just the beginning of healing and that ability not only to heal ourselves and to begin to connect and heal our community and our friends and our family, I just think of restoration in terms of restoring all of us. What comes to mind for you when I think about, or when I explore restoration? Yeah, it's, that's, that's a great question. And I've got to say, I find it a, a challenging question. Um, I, th I think that um, part of all of this and, and the way we were living right up until COVID hit mm -hmm. is that we were enjoying this amazing run of success, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what, what can happen at that point is we stop growing. Mm. Um, and I'm not saying everybody did stop growing, but that mm. that can happen and and growth is fundamental to to life and and i feel that you know western world particularly really got stuck in its head mm. in our lives were spent in our mind we're actually even celebrating people's minds and that sort of stuff and somehow our hearts sort of got a little bit left behind, you know, and if we've only got to look around at what we've been doing in the world and we realise that, you know, our genuine care and love for the planet and for other cultures and for other creatures has fallen to a, a terrible level, you know, it really has. And so, and because of that, there's this balance has been lost in the world you know, the environment is really, really struggling. And then we've got these brilliant minds who are trying to convince us that the environment isn't struggling, but it is. And then the gap between the rich and the poor is widening. And there's people living in absolutely horrendous conditions of destitution, you know. And so what the world needed was to restore some balance in that. Mm -hmm. And I think it starts with all of us as individuals restoring that balance between our heads mm -hmm. and our hearts mm -hmm. and learning to care more and learning to remember what love truly is, you know? And love is something that doesn't have cultural boundaries. It doesn't have species boundaries. Well, it doesn't it's, have it, boundaries or conditions. That's what's beautiful about it. Yeah, thank you. That's absolutely. And so, you know, this whole, this restoration of this balance between head and heart has been so essential. But, you know, the head part of it is still fighting to not let that happen. You know? and, and really, John, if you think about just that restoration and we talk about anxiety, anxiety means divided. So, you know, we're having the anxiety because we're divided between love and fear. That's what's mm -hmm. going on in our brain constantly is this battle mm -hmm. of wanting to experience love and then afraid of what if I, you know, don't get love or, I mean, it's just amazing that something that we want so much, our own head can be disconnecting us from our heart for it. Yeah, you bet. And it's again, that's that calculation of the mind. What can I get, you know? Mm -hmm. And I reckon that um, the only way to get more love in the world is to give a lot more of it away. Yeah. You know, that's the way we get it to multiply. And we've seen in these lockdowns how communities have become stronger. People's kindness has come to the fore. And I'll go back to it. I said this uh, a little while back, um, Kale, with this, you know, if the fundamental, if people said to me, we want to have a workplace wellness program 
and we haven't got a budget, we've got no money, what can we do? My response would be just talk to everybody about being a lot more kind. Start, start yeah. with kindness, start with love, start with gratitude. I mean, gratitude's mm -hmm. a beautiful winning strategy that restores us very quickly. From the minute we start thinking about what we're grateful for, our body starts to restore. So there's so many things that we have right here in our own control that we don't have to have a budget for or have to have a big program for. We can just start to live well-being. Well, there's a great story. If any of your... Um listeners are sports fans there's a guy that um who, who i know personally um i wouldn't say he's a close friend or anything but but i love him um he is the best player in our professional football leagues here in australia at the moment now when he came onto the scene he had a troubled past raised by his grandmother his, his dad's a bikey you know um and we turned up on the scene, he had a lot of tattoos on his body and a very odd sort of half shaven hairdo and that sort of thing. And he just looked really hard and, you know, <laughs> and, um, and the press, you know, some journalists gave him a really hard time. And, he, but he's actually a very quiet, very shy sort of person. And he did a, a program here in Australia, a young guy created a program for schools called the Resilience Project. And it got so popular, it moved into the corporate arena and his football club ran the program. And this Resilience Project has these gratitude diaries mm -hmm. and something about gratitude touched Dustin. His name is Dustin Martin. Everybody affectionately calls him Dusty. Mm -hmm. And Dusty went up to the guy and he said, hmm, those diaries, he goes, oh, I'll take all of them. And he took enough for a year. And every night he has to write down mm. the things he's grateful for. And the guy was telling on radio how about a year later he got a text and said, the text said, have you got any more of those diaries? And he texted back and said, who is this? And the, this message came back, it's Dusty. <laughs> And so what happened from there, he went from being a run of the mill player mm -hmm. who everybody was suspicious of that he would eventually go off the rails and do something bad to becoming winning three um, premierships, which is like Super Bowls mm -hmm. and being awarded the, uh, the medal for the best player on, on the ground in each of those games. And he also won the, the competition's highest honour. And, and each time when at the trophy ceremonies at the end of the game, when they hand out the medals and they gave him his uh, medal for being best player on the ground, as he ran back to his teammates, he put the medal inside his jumper because mm. he didn't want to be different to his teammates. Mm, you know? yeah, and he's, he's so loved and so respected and the whole country went into a bit of horror last week because he got hit really badly and tore his kidney and he's out for the rest of the season now but i found out yesterday that he's okay and um and all that but we're very grateful but, he's okay yes but that's how a life can change by practicing gratitude that's because true. you know his practice of gratitude shifted the way the world looked at him mm -hmm without him having to say anything to anybody, you know? Well, and, and the, the energy, the energy that came from that gratitude is more love in the world and more gratitude, right? It just keeps building and giving out such greatness versus that negativity that's a subtractor. So we want to be the addition to the world. We want to give hope. We want to be givers. We want to give love, joy, gratitude, and most importantly, we want to give you hope, team, so that you can really take great care of yourself so that you can give to whoever it is that you want in our world. So, John, it's been such a 10 getting to connect with you. Really very, very grateful to you for sharing your time with us. Appreciate you being on our team and just helping anyone listening to be able to have hope to go out and win their well-being. Thanks, Carla. And everybody, all the very best. One day at a time. And you'll get there. That's cool. It's like the what's the um, answer? The secret to eating an elephant, right? <laughs> one one bite at a time. 
Bone at a time. <laughs> but it's got to be an organic elephant. Remember. <laughs> yeah. And it's one, it's one choice at a time. Choose, you know, choose what serves you best. So team, it's up to you. Go out and be a champion for your well-being before you, before your environment, before your community, before your teammates, before your family. What a great two-month season to go for being really everything you've ever wanted and know you can do it. You can do it. Just win the choices. Okay, team, go out and have a great week. Thank you, John. Thanks, Kelly.